let's get to the show. Good morning. Oh, I'd like to, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> the next speaker uh, that we have, we're not going to talk to the Academy right now. Uh, uh, we're going to talk to them a little bit later. But our first speaker of the day is uh, someone very special. And all, you all are. But Anthony Wood, who's the CEO of Roku, has been, uh, he's a veteran in our, in our industry. He's initiated many uh, technologies. We're all familiar with his work on Replay TV and, of course, Roku now. And I, uh, I admire his chutzpah. And uh, as I have always been calling him, he's a maverick. He's a, he's a, he thinks ahead and he pushes with his ideas. He's a visionary and then he takes action. So I want to welcome Anthony Wood to the stage to give you a nice presentation. Anthony. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Greetings. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for coming to San Francisco to see me. So I'm going to uh, talk today about um, all the innovation that's happening in television right now. You know, I think that uh, we're seeing actually more innovation in the world of te television right now than has ever happened in history. And uh, there's lots of opportunity being created for new brands, uh, new companies, and a lot more choice and uh, value for consumers. So there's tons of innovation happening. Uh, in the industry, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, if you guys remember the cable card and open cable and how that didn't work out so well, but, you know, with the internet creating open platforms, that the vision for that world is actually finally here. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I get there, I just want to uh, do a brief questionnaire. How many, how many of you guys um, have a Roku player? So it looks like about a third. Uh, well, for the rest of you, it's not too late. You can go to Walmart, Target, uh, Radio Shack, really any reputable retailer, and for $50, get a Roku player. So, you know, please do that after the show. Um, so Roku is a company based locally. We're in Saratoga. Uh, a lot of people think Roku is an Asian-Japanese company because Roku means six in Japanese, but we're not, we're not Asian. We're American. Um, and we're in a business that's booming. I mean, sales are excellent. Sales last year tripled. Um, year over year in units, and we passed $100 million in sales last year, so um, business is good. Um, but let me, let me talk about television now. If this works. Yep, excellent. Okay, so uh, go back for a second to 1996. Um, the top movie in the box office in 1996 was uh, Independence Day. I, I saw it. I don't know if you guys saw it. Um, and then Fargo was, was a big movie back then. From Dust Till Dawn was one of my favorites. It came out in 1996. But probably the most exciting thing in 1996 was the American Telecommunications Act of 1996, passed by the US Congress and signed into law by Bill Clinton. And uh, that was a joke. It wasn't that exciting. But, um, and it created this idea of the cable card. And the world was going to be great. Uh, you know, We were going to open the cable boxes. You're going to be able to go to Best Buy and buy a, a cable box, you know, it would be better and cheaper than the one you got from your cable company. And that was the plan. And then many years later, in 2009, uh, you know, the FCC admitted that it wasn't going to work, and uh, the cable card, you know, was basically a failure. And Gadget said, hell freezes over, FCC admits the end of the cable card. And so, you know, that, that approach of trying to open up the cable business to competition didn't work. But what has worked is the internet. So, you know, at the same time, we've been seeing, you know, music being transformed, books by the internet, and it's happening to video now. And so the, the internet is creating new distribution platforms, and this chart just shows, for example, uh, Netflix, you know, growing and Blockbuster declining in revenue, and Blockbuster obviously eventually uh, going bankrupt. And so, you know, originally television was distributed over the air, there were three networks, and then came cable and satellite, and now is the internet. And I think you know, just think about that for a second. I think within four years, almost the majority of all pay television is going to be distributed over the internet, and it won't be on it won't be on proprietary cable networks anymore. And it's going to create new brands, and new winners and new losers. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So I think the thing to remember about TV is people like to watch TV on TV. Sometimes people lose sight of that. And uh, content is the most important thing, and uh, on Roku, this chart shows as we've added more channels, uh, you know, we started with one channel, Netflix, and we're past 500 channels now. 
adding a new channel every day on average, one a day on average. And as the number of channels has grown, the number of view the viewing hours has also grown. And so we're up to 12 hours a week on Netflix, on, I mean, sorry, on, on Roku players. And it's growing, and I think it'll keep growing until it hits 35 hours a week, which is the average in the, in the US for uh, TV viewing. And then a little bit more about content. So there's, of course, the traditional content players, uh, you know, HB, the networks, HBO, Lifetime, ESPN, Disney Channel, and so forth. But the internet is creating uh, new companies, and they're in two buckets. So one bucket is Netflix, uh, you know, uh, Hulu Plus, Crackle, these sort of traditional, I mean, now they're traditional, they were new a few years ago, uh, bundles of sort of back catalog content, in some cases newer TV shows, uh, but basically bundles of existing content sold on, generally on a subscription basis and originally launched over the internet and bypassed traditional cable, and that is a new package of content. Then the other, the other type of content that's growing is new brands. So YouTube, I think, for example, is a, is a classic example, but you know, there's, also, there's lots of other new brands, like Glenn Beck TV is very popular on Roku, which is, you know, Glenn Beck is a controversial talk show host, and uh, he a big personality on Fox. He left Fox and started his own uh, network called Glenn Beck TV, and he's got 300,000 subscribers. He makes a lot more money doing that than he was getting paid by Fox. And he's on, you know, you can watch his network on, on laptops, you can watch it on Roku. So these new brands are being, are being created as well. So this chart here just shows what's popular on Roku. Uh, and, and the way this chart was done is if you go to the Roku channel store, uh, which is, you know, what we call our apps, or we call them channels because they're generally video apps. Uh, there's one of the ways the content is sorted is by popularity and there's something called the most popular row. Uh, and in the most popular row, you can see what's popular on Roku. And, and so this sh shows what's pop a snapshot of recent shows that were popular. And that, you know, like you'd expect, Netflix is at the top. Netflix still drives this industry for everyone. Um, but there's other, sh other channels that are popular. So sports are popular on Roku. Um, games like Angry Birds. So if you think about it in terms of like, I'm watching TV, doing something on my TV and spending time on it. And if you do measure it by time, then Angry Birds is one of the most popular channels on Roku, actually. And then HBO Go, which I think is uh, pretty amazing. I mean, this is a, a network that used to be on cable only. Now it's available on devices like Roku. Now, so now, you know, going back to the cable card idea, you can now actually go to Best Buy and buy a $50 box and get HBO, and, uh, which is authenticated. You have to have a cable subscription, but you're not going to get a... You can, not use your cable box, you can use your Roku player. And so that dream is, is here and happening, and I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. We're gonna see a lot more of these um, authenticated type, type channels. So speaking of authenticated channels, um, so there's these cable networks, the incumbents, and they're still very popular, and they have great content, and they're gonna remain popular for, forever. Uh, and they are now coming to boxes like Roku, and I think it's something that at least two years ago I, I wouldn't have expected. Uh, but it's starting to happen. It's both, both the networks on an authenticated basis, but also the operators. We know we're in discussions with most of the major operators about putting their services on Roku, which I would never have expected a couple of years ago. So one of the questions I get a lot is, what's going to happen with the bundle on television? Is there going to be the continued bundling of television, is it, going to, is it going to be a la carte? Are people going to be out, are customers going to be able to go and just sign up for ESPN, for example? And I think the answer to that is, is not anytime soon. Uh, you know, I think Comcast just signed a 10-year deal with Disney, which includes ESPN. And so that, and they own, Disney owns a bunch of channels which they bundle, and so that bundle is not going to break anytime soon, for, just for example. So I think what we will see is more options for customers an fraying of the bundle, but uh, the bundle is going to still be there. And, uh, and in fact, in many cases, customers like bundles. Uh, for example, Netflix is actually a bundle of content. You know, customers don't want to go out and buy shows one off. They want to be able to subscribe to something and get a bundle. So I think that's going to be here for a long time. And then I think one of the interesting questions is 
who will be the first virtual MSO? So who's going to be the first company to take a, you know, when are you going to be able to go to, to Walmart, buy a Roku player, take it home, hook it up, and sign up for a pay package of content similar that, that looks a lot like you would get from a cable company? And I think that's going to happen this year. So, um, you know, we see a lot of activity there, and it wouldn't surprise me if that happens this year. And that'll be a big, a big change in the industry. Uh, but one of the questions I get a lot as well is, well, why, why are cable operators and cable networks uh, doing these things? Like, why are they putting their content on Roku's, on Apple's, on iPads? You know, why is that happening? And the, and the answer is fairly straightforward. You know, they're seeing competition for companies like Netflix. They have customers they're charging, let's say, $70 a month for, uh, you know, just let's say. And those customers are generally happy customers, but some of them are canceling their cable, and they're trying to figure out how can they make their customers happier, and if they, if they can allow their customers that are already paying for this package of content to get on other devices, that creates more value for their customers, and so that's the reason that they're doing this. And so not only are they making their content packages available on uh, tablets and laptops, they're making them available on streaming players like, like Roku as well. And I think that's a trend that... Uh, started last year and is going to continue this year. I think by the end of next year will be something that is widespread and all the operators and all the networks are going to be doing. Um, but if you think about a television is moving to the internet, it's being delivered by the internet, and you know, it's, it's, there's other devices that you can get television on these days, uh, laptops and tablets, for example, but television TVs themselves are actually still the main way people watch watch television, and most viewing is on television sets. And so what are the devices, what are the platforms that people can access internet-delivered television on directly to their TV? And today it's mostly game consoles, um, because there's a lot of game consoles. Uh, and so the chart, the chart on the left is actually fairly accurate in terms of proportions, and then the, the bar on the right is uh, kind of more projection uh, where we think the world is heading, but based on data that we see in the field. So like I said, today it's game consoles, number one, and then uh, other segments are you know, computers, streaming players like Roku, smart TVs, Blu-ray players, those kinds of things. But what's happening is the gaming consoles, they're not actually growing. I mean, there's a lot of them because there's, there's a lot of them out there, but as new customers as, as decide that they want to add streaming, you know, they're not generally going out and buying a gaming console unless they're a gamer. They're, instead, they're buying streaming players and smart TVs, and those are actually the two segments that are growing. And over the next four years, we expect those two segments to be the majority of the way um, internet television is delivered to TVs, smart TVs, and, and streaming players. And streaming players are uh, like Roku and uh, Apple TV. So another trend that's very important, I think, um, in this business of work, you know these new open platforms are being created for internet television. Another another important component of this is the home screen. And what's happening is, you know, in a world where on Roku today, there's already 500 plus channels and growing. If you're a big brand, a content brand, you know, you don't want to just be in the channel store. You want uh, to be front and center. And so there's a lot of jockeying for position, who's on the home screen, where are you on. It's sort of like in the old days with EPGs where, you know, you wanted to be channel number one, and that was the best channel to be. Uh, you know, if you got channel 99 or 500, not, not as good. So it's the same thing, except I would say even worse with new over-the-top devices. So you can see, for example, in this example, we have HBO Go on the home screen, which is what they want. And then you've got the Xfinity um, app, as an example, on a tablet where brands like HBO Go are buried inside the Xfinity app. And so obviously, HBO prefers to be on the home screen, and Xfinity prefers HBO to be in their app. And so you have this sort of dynamic that's going on. But anyway, the home screen, I think, is a thing to watch in this, in this business as it evolves. Um, but what's happening, so, you know, we've got these platforms that both hardware and software that internet-delivered television is being watched on, connected to your TV, and it used to be there were lots of platforms, right? When Netflix launched, they actually ported it to over 200 different devices. And, uh, but that's not what is happening now. What's happening now is content partners are supporting just a few platforms. So when HBO Go launched, for example, they launched on three platforms, Roku, Samsung, and Xbox. And that's pretty typical. 
we're seeing that a lot. What's happening is platforms are consolidating, content partners are not wanting to support a bunch of different platforms, and, um, and, and even the technology is becoming very complicated, and so it just most companies are not actually capable of doing their own platform anymore. You know, the number of engineers, you know, we have, um, we have over 100 software engineers working on our platform, and it doubles every, every year, it's doubling. So the amount of technology that's going into it is, is large. And it, you know, it used to be if you were a smart TV vendor, you could just go buy an SOC from Broadcom, and they would give you a few channels, and that would be your smart TV, but that's not sufficient these days. So, you know, what goes into making a great platform? Uh, so they're consolidating, but there are these platforms, they're open, you know, content is coming, they're providing a great experience for customers, and what, what goes into the platform? What's the important components that we see? Because that's, I mean, that's our business, is to be a TV platform for the smart TVs and for these streaming player boxes. Uh, so one is you have to support a bunch of different devices. So like I said, the two segments that are growing, boxes and smart TVs and other kinds of TV devices um, are important to support. So uh, we do that at Roku, others are trying to do that. Um, we have something called the streaming stick. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's, uh, it's basically a Roku on a little stick that you can plug in the side of your TV and, add, and it adds a complete Roku experience to, to a TV. And then we're working other ways to expand the reach of our platform as well. But having a broad reach on the platform, especially on those two segments that are growing, the streaming players and smart TVs are important. And then the technology pieces that go into the platform to support the content partners. So uh, the SDK, advertising systems, uh, billing systems, you know, security, analytics, there's just a bunch of different pieces that you have to provide on the software side. And then you have to have a lot of scale and that attracts content partners and that's what customers want is a lot of content. So those are the pieces I think that make a successful platform. And, that, and these open platforms um, you know, are, are what's gonna be the way people watch TV going forward. And so, you know, this is kind of what the world looks like today, a squiggly line. Uh, you know, it's coming faster than people think. There's a lot of churn and a lot of, a lot of changes, a lot of new brands being created, a lot of opportunity, new winners, new losers, things like, you know, uh, content becoming on demand, virtual MSOs, being able to get a box that delivers your cable service by going to Best Buy, lots of changes. The DVR is dying. I mean, the DVR is a, is, um, you know, it was a stepping stone technology to, on, to true on demand. The first step of its death is moving into the cloud, but then I think after that it's just gonna go away and it's much better to be able to say, I wanna watch any TV show ever made rather than I have to remember to record it. So that's gonna go away. And then we're gonna end up where there's a, f a handful of platforms that are popular and just the way, you know, the same way there's Windows and Apple on, on, on PCs and the way there's Android and Apple on Mobile, there's gonna be a few platforms for TV, Apple will be one, Roku, and then maybe a third like Microsoft, for example, or maybe Samsung. So that's, there's gonna be a shakeout there. Um, so that's where I think things are heading, and uh, that's it, thank you. If you guys have any questions, I think we have time for questions. Um, one on the uh, slide with the current uh, segments and the projected segments, mm -hmm. you have Blu-ray becoming almost vanishingly small, Right. yet most homes will have Blu-ray players and most of those will be internet capable and in many cases it's the same, the same platform as the smart TV, it's Samsung, LG, some of those, it's the same whether it's a Blu-ray player or a TV, so I'm curious what your thinking is as to why you think so few people would use that as opposed to a streaming box. And two, can you address the lack of YouTube on Roku? I think that's a pretty major feature that when I use my Roku, often, you know, that I find that missing. Right. Well, on Blu-ray players, you know, I think Blu-ray players are gonna peak fairly soon. Sales of Blu-ray players, I think, will peak maybe this year or next year. And, um, yeah, if you just think about the future, do you think people are gonna be using Blu-ray players four years from now? I don't, I don't think so, not most people. So. Uh, they still sell well uh, at Christmas because people are looking for gifts and streaming is sort of a new category still. And so what happens is someone goes into Walmart and they go, well, I think the streaming is cool, but I know, that, but, uh, they, I know my, 
my you know dad or whatever is going to know what a Blu-ray player is, so I'll get him the, that box because it does both. But so that that's what supports sales at Christmas. But I think sales are going to start declining, and um, the experience on Blu-ray players, the streaming experience compared to what you get on a Roku, is is not very good. And you, there's a premium you you pay for the Blu-ray player. I mean, royalties alone on Blu-ray players in terms of the cost structure is like twenty dollars, and so. Um, now, that's balanced by the fact that most companies are selling Blu-ray players at a loss at Christmas to help sell TVs. So anyway, I think, and then I think if you think about Roku's goal of extending our platform to other devices, I mean, Blu-ray players is something we look at. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if there were Blu-ray players with Roku built in at some point. But like I said, I think if you think long term, they're going to they're gonna decline and eventually go away. So they're not strategic for us. Like strategic for us are the two segments that are growing smart TVs and streaming players, because eventually those will be the majority. Um, now YouTube, so YouTube, you know, we're working on it. It's going to come to Roku. It's a hole in our offering. Uh, and there's no, the, the reasons are just, it's a long story. And they're all sort of um, tactical. There's not really any good reason for it. So thanks. Hi. Hi. I love my Roku, and my dog loves to chew on the remote, but my question is about the smart TV slide where you showed how much that is growing. If smart TVs are going to grow so much and have these services built into the smart TV, why will I need a Roku in the future, even if it's just the stick? Uh, so our goal at Roku is to, for our platform to be the, platform, the, the dominant platform in those two segments. And so, you know, streaming stick is the first step. There's other things we're looking at. You know, our goal is if you buy a smart TV four years from now, it will come with Roku in one, one form or another. Now, that said, I think, I think there's actually an open question as to whether, uh, you know, the smart TV platform built into a smart TV is going to be the way uh, most television viewing platforms for, over the internet are delivered. I mean, so today, for example, lots of smart TVs are sold. They're not, they're not used. Um, they're used as TVs. They're not generally used as smart TVs. For example, last year, um, Roku, we streamed twice as many hours as all smart TVs streamed ever sold. So lots, but there's way more smart TVs. It's just that they're not being, people don't buy a TV for their smart TV feature. They, when a customer goes into a store looking for TV, you know, they look at screen size and price and everything else pales. And actually almost last on their consideration list is whether it's got streaming built in. So that said, uh, and, and so if you look at sort of the history, you know, you got of boxes. There are, when boxes have enough value, they're actually, they're actually used a lot. So game consoles, cable boxes, satellite boxes, you know, when people, when they provide a good value and they provide a way to upgrade. The other problem with TVs, of course, is that they, people keep them for seven, eight years. And then the electronics and the software in a streaming device, you know, it's like a smartphone. It, uh, becomes obsolete in two or three years and you want to upgrade it. So all those factors make me wonder if the future of TV is really just a great monitor. But that all said, you know, smart TVs are growing as a percentage basis and we're committed to getting our platform in there. I think we'll just see whether the majority of streaming hours is actually through the integrated platform or whether it's through, through a box. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I think they want you to use the, um, the mic. Um, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported this morning that the Justice Department's looking at the cable industry in terms of some sort of antitrust investigation, and already some of the kind of instant analysis about that raises concerns that that could slow cable's sort of experiments or pushes to IP video distribution. What do you think, um, you know, could anything really slow that down, or are they gung-ho about this kind of stuff, and, and what do you make of the fact that you know, the government's taking a look at the way, presumably, cable operators price their broadband and how that affects online video. Uh, I, I didn't read that article, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how that's affecting things. I, what I can say, though, is that in my talks with companies in the industry, uh, cable operators and cable networks, uh, they're generally super enthusiastic about uh, their content on an authenticated basis on multiple devices in the home and eventually outside the home. And so um, I don't see anything slowing that. I think, I know, I know what we have work, working in our labs and the deals we have signed. And so I think it's gonna be a huge, huge factor in the, in the, in the industry um, over the next couple of years, so. Yeah. 
I also love my rook when I use it, uh, but uh, clearly you are uh, channel centric. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you see evolution, uh, uh, some kind of evolution, so you will be content centric, where the users actually can uh, figure out what I feel like watching, and then you will let me know where to find it within the channels? Yeah, that's a good question. So we get asked that a lot. And uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, that's going to happen. I mean, we're doing a lot of work on evolving our user interface. How do we bubble up content? How can you do cross provider search? Um, you know, how can you help customers find? There's a lot of content in the back catalog. How can you help customers find that content? Um, and, you know, people in the industry especially say, well, you, sh you know, why don't you have search? You should be more aggressive on your UI. But when we talk to our customers, we sold, you know, over 3 million Roku players and sales are accelerating. And I've never had someone call me and say, boy, your box is too complicated. I can't figure out how to use it. And so, you know, we have to, we have to balance, we have to make sure, People buy Roku's because they have great content, they're cheap, and they're super simple to use. And so we want to keep it simple. So we're doing a lot of testing around, you know, before we change the UI to something that's more content-centric. We're doing a lot of testing. Uh, it's going to happen, but we're going to make sure that we do it in a way that doesn't confuse our users. And that, that's, one, that's the main factor. There are other factors like, um, you know, there's a lot of conflict in the industry. You know, you can imagine that a content uh, aggregator like Netflix or Hulu you know, our big partners today, or HBO, you know, they don't, they don't want their content on the Roku home screen. They want you to go on HBO and never, never leave. That's their world. So there's, you know, so then there's this discussion that happens with them on what's possible, what they would like to do, what, our, you know, what is good for customers, what's good for their business models. So it's complicated and it's going to um, evolve over the next few years. Hey, Anthony. I'm uh, interested in your view going forward of interactivity and companion products and how Roku fits into those. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So we have a team now dedicated to second screen experiences. Um, you know, the original view of interactivity on TV, I think, was flawed. And, you know, web TV, even Google TV, a lot of their, I think, troubles are because they're too interactive, too complicated for their user interface. But I think if you move that to a, a tablet or a mobile phone where it actually, that's the UI metaphor for those devices, it makes a lot of sense. And so we're, you know, we're starting out, we released our first apps for Android and iPhone, uh, I think about six months ago. But we have a team continuing to evolve it and the direction we're heading is kind of different, different paths. So one path is better control, like a better UI for your TV, but, you know, like uh, just a great user interface with more rich user interface. Another path is taking content that you've got on your device and sending it to your TV. So some, something kind of like AirPlay on the Apple has, but also just, you know, I've got photos on my, lap, on my laptop or my tablet and I want to look at them on my TV. And then the third, I think, where the interactivity comes in is um, sort of two areas. One is one of the, when we do surveys, what we find is the most common thing uh, our customers do with their tablet when they're watching TV is uh, look up information on the actors and the shows on IMDb. So showing context information like I'm watching a, I got my remote on my tablet and I'm watching a movie and automatically it shows me the actors and directors and I can look at other movies by the same directors and so forth. So that's something we're working on. And then, um, and then advertising. I think there's opportunity for advertising that's context sensitive, that's targeted. This, and this interactive, where there's a, you know, the, one of the great things about web-based advertising is you can click on it and then do something, like buy something. And so you can do that, I think, with TV advertising if the ads appear on a tablet. So that's another area we're heading. Hi. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, I'm over here, no. um, <laughs> uh, the future of UI on Roku. Uh, you have so many channels, and for content companies, our challenges are, how can we, uh, you know, allow our customers to find our content right. in these uh, brave new platforms? So, love yep. to hear your thoughts about how you see that evolving. Yeah, I think it's a big challenge for content owners and for the customers, and for us. I mean, like I was saying, I think the big there's different dimensions to the problem. One dimension is we want to keep it simple, but we want to make recommendations. Um, so, I think creating more promotional spots in the, at the home screen is a simple step in the right direction. Um, doing more targeted recommendations, you know, uh, Netflix does a great job at this, right, where they, they figure out that you've got kids in your family and they start showing you kids' movies. And so 
things like that, which make more optimal use of the promotional spots. And then, um, uh, I think there's always how popular something is. So if you have popular content, it's going to tend to bubble up to the top. Okay. Do we have time for any more questions or no? Okay. We're done. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs>